research. Um, so in my relatively short presentation, I'm going to be talking you through the intersections of ethics and law. And I suppose the, the core point I'm going to be making is that uh, law is playing a greater role in um, the way in which clinical trials are operating. I'll just be identifying uh, some of those roles. Um, and I, I say that in a sense for good or ill, uh, and you can make your own mind up about that. Um, so in one way, if we think about intersections with law, law's always been there when it comes to uh, research ethics. So uh, you will see there uh, one of the still photographs from uh, the famous Nordenberg trial, uh, trials uh, of, of um, an, a Nazi scientist, uh, which was formerly known as United States versus Karl Brandt et al. Uh, over 1946-47. And from there, of course, we got the Nuremberg Code. So the Nuremberg Code was presented as part of the, uh, the trial documents. So in, in that sense, you saw the law there really very early on in terms of um, legal involvement. Um, you see, I suppose, the medical world, in a sense, taking back um, control uh, and um, grounding that control in ethics with, of course, the, the Helsinki Declaration of 1964. Uh, and that is, as you know, is, is the foundational or a foundational document in terms of um, research ethics, um, but it doesn't have a formal legal status. So uh, whilst it's it's very significant, it's not legally significant in the same way as uh, some of the uh, things I'm going to be talking about in a moment. Uh, just again, to continue looking at this in a sense, intersections or, or weaving between law and ethics, um, just going to, to, to remind you, and I'm sure, again, this will be familiar to, to many of you, you'll probably recognize that image of the Tuskegee uh, study there, the uh, syphilis study in the southern states of the United States, which was deeply and profoundly unethical. Um, but again, if we go back and we look at how ethics and law, so the ethics initially coming out of the medical profession, uh, and then becoming in some ways professionalized uh, into to kind of the profession of ethics. But many of you will know about Henry Beecher, uh, famous uh, publication in the 1966 New England Journal of Medicine on ethics and clinical research, where Henry Beecher, who was an, an anesthetist and was the chair of the medical faculty in Harvard at the time, um, published a, a very damning article outlining a number of clinical studies, a substantial number of clinical studies, which were being conducted in a way which he considered and which we, with our modern uh, perspectives, I think, would certainly consider to be unethical. Um, so again, you're seeing this coming out of the medical profession, but then you're seeing a response by the law. Uh, and the, the, the response was the introduction of the National Research Act of 1974 which in turn set up a national commission for the protection of human subjects of biomedical and behavioral research. And this, in a sense, was part of the professionalization of ethics as something separate from the medical profession. And of course, out of that commission, uh, we had the Belmont Report and the Belmont Principles. And again, I'd imagine this is something which you'll all be uh, familiar with. And there you're seeing the centralization in, in any kind of ethics um, approval process of things like informed consent, um, requirements for, for an assessment of risks and benefits. Um, and again, if, if if we talk about Laura's earlier presentation and the identification of the role of statistics in, in that, um, and then selection of subjects, how one selects subjects. And again, uh, Laura's earlier presentation there spoke to the, the need of inclusion there. Inclusion wasn't a huge issue back in the Belmont report. The Belmont report was more about excluding people who were vulnerable rather than the issue which is now with us of including people to ensure that they're uh, represented and their populations are represented. So if we go and, and this is a little bit of a whistle stop uh, tour, both globally or um, 
physically, geographically and, and legally. But uh, if we look at what's been going on in um, more recent times, uh, I'm, I'm looking here at the European Union uh, map there, and you'll see our nearest neighbour, uh, as you know, is no longer a member of the European Union, which tends to have uh, implications sometimes in, in some of the trials we see coming to, to the NREX. Um, but at a European Union level, we have um, seen quite a, a body of, of legislation in relation to um, health research uh, emerge in within the last decade. Um, the big one, which took a very long time to get up and running, but is now up and running, is, of course, uh, as I'm sure Laura will have spoken about, the Clinical Trials Regulation of 2014. And then we've got a couple of medical devices regulations, one from 2017, and then the in vitro uh, diagnostic medical devices regulation, uh, which was amended in 2022. And this is all about Europe trying to make itself a good place to do research and various things are done to try to facilitate Europe in making itself both a good place to do research and attractive place to do research um, for, for sponsors, but also to uh, ensure that um, participants are protected. The other piece of legislation I've put up there is one that uh, isn't specifically aimed at research, but has a profound impact, as again, many of you will know, on how research is being done. And that is the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. And I'm going to talk in a second about how those European measures are translated into Irish law. But the, the big message, I suppose, is that the law is playing an increasing role here. Um, so just briefly, uh, and it's it's the one I know most about, so I'll, I'll talk to the way in which the clinical trials regulation is uh, working to uh, enhance research in Europe, but also enhance um, ethical research in Europe. Uh, so as, as Laura will have talked about, the establishment of CETAS, this clinical trials information system, uh, requirements for both scientific and ethical reviews and both separately. Um, placing on a legal footing um, ethics committees. And we'll have a look again at, at how, or in a moment, at how we do that in Ireland. Um, but those ethics committees, it's left to member states of the European Union to decide how they do their ethics committee. We made a particular choice in Ireland and for clinical trials and medical devices went for a national research ethics committee. The law requires now that layperson views be taken into account and especially patient views. And those legal requirements uh, for protection of subjects are now also part of the law. They're very clearly part of uh, the, the 2014 regulation. So risk benefit analysis, informed consent requirements, um, couple of things to draw to your attention. I'm going to talk a little bit more about legally designated representatives in a moment. Uh, and then the other thing, which I think is, is, is definitely a step forward in the 2014 regulation, is um, the introduction of special rules on clinical trials in emergency situations, because that was a, a real gap in, in the regulatory format and, and, and created real uh, problems. And that has been, at least to a degree, uh, addressed. So here you have the Irish legislation, uh, and I have put up there, it's it's actually the first piece of legislation, in a sense, relevant legislation, uh, in, in terms of legislation, which is relevant now, uh, to be introduced, and that is the health research regulations, and that is concerned with data protections, the Data Protection Act health research regulations. And I should say at this point, Ireland is something of an outlier in uh, European terms in that, uh, and again, many of you will know this, uh, we really prioritise consent um, and the consent of the individual to data processing. Um, many other European uh, Union countries um, 
use what is called the public interest or the legitimate interest um, data processing ground rather than the consent data processing ground. But one of the things which is, is really notable about Ireland is our emphasis on consent. Uh, and sometimes, for example, in a in a in a uh, an NREC in a in a clinical trial review, you'll see um, clinical trials from other jurisdictions which don't necessarily take the consent element as seriously as we have to in Ireland. Uh, it's a legal obligation on us. Uh, really, just to take you through, then these are all statutory instruments. They're introduced by the Department of Health. Um, and I suppose um, you, you can see the relatively recent, we've got the 21 medical devices regulation, and then we've got a couple of regulations um, from 2022, one of which really establishes the, the National Research Ethics um, Committee, and uh, the other of which contains quite a lot of um, regulation around, uh, in, in this instance, clinical trials. I've just put up there, just in case you happen to be looking uh, and to see what's going on regulation-wise. There was a statutory instrument, it was number 40 of 2022, that's now repealed and replaced by that 99 statutory instrument. So just in case you happen to be looking uh, to make sure you avoid confusion there, that that number 40 is gone. It's, it's no longer part of the, the legal framework. But if you Google, you'll still get it. So just to take you uh, very quickly through the key elements of the Irish legislation, as you know, uh, it's all the establishment of the National Office within the Health Research Board, the establishment of the National Research Ethics Committees, uh, of which uh, I know Laura has been speaking. Uh, it also imposes a domestic duty to comply with all the consent requirements in the CTR in the 2014 regulation. So that's both European requirement, but it's also uh, in introduced into domestic law there in, in that 2022 uh, regulations. And the other thing, and I was just looking at it this morning, there's a remarkably long list of penalties um, for conducting a trial uh, outside of the uh, requirements, uh, the legal requirements set down in the uh, in the regulations, uh, and a remarkable amount of powers given to uh, HIPRA as the authority, um, which can consult with the the ethics committee and can engage with the ethics committee to conduct uh, an investigation. I'm very conscious of time, so I am going to talk about this quite quickly, um, just to draw your attention to participants lacking capacity. Uh, and the CTR uh, includes uh, special requirements. By the CTR there, I mean the 2014 uh, EU regulation. Uh, it includes special requirements uh, in relation to involving participants lacking capacity. Uh, and there is an access issue here. Um, particularly uh, in relation to certain conditions, it is important to ensure that participants have the opportunity to participate, even if they lack uh, capacity. Um, so the uh, regulation, CTR, um, includes special requirements, including rules about assent, and they apply to both children and adults lacking capacity. The assent of the participant um, is is required in in those situations. So they they remain in, in many ways very central to to any uh, clinical trial. Um, in relation to adult, in relation to children, it's their legal guardian gives consent uh, up to the age of sixteen. After that, the the, the uh, young person can consent themselves. Um, for adults, consent is given by a legally designated representative, and that's the terminology of the CTR. Uh, and I have just put up on the slide there who in Irish law is the legally designated representative. In other words, who can give consent uh, on behalf of a um, an adult lacking capacity. Uh, and you'll see there it's a person who can provides the best interpretation of the individual's will and preferences based on their knowledge of the individual. Uh, so that idea of will and preferences, which is 
you know, playing a bigger role in Irish law at the moment because of the uh, Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act, um, that is full and central uh, in in in, les in in legally designated representative. But if nobody's in that category, uh, and that can happen in certain uh, emergency situations or situations where uh, there, there there just isn't anybody. The medical practitioner primarily responsible for the medical treatment provided to the individual, provided that that medical practitioner can provide the best interpretation of the individual's will and preferences and, and that and is important there and I've emphasised it, they're not involved in the trial. And obviously they must also be of the view that participation will not harm the individual's health and well-being. So there you neatly see the CTR and the Irish um, regulation working side by side. CTR identifies the role of the legally designated representative and then the Irish legislation identifies who that legally designated representative can be. So to conclude, um, there is close ongoing interaction between law and ethics in the area of um, uh, health research. Uh, there is, I think you would say, an increased legalization of ethical processes. Uh, so that is not in any way to diminish the importance of ethics. But it is to be aware that uh, you're seeing more law coming into this space. And then finally, uh, the role of data protection uh, and Ireland's relatively un well, unusual position regarding uh, consent. And I should, as a final uh, point mentioned there, I referred to it on my last slide, that if you're doing research with adults lacking capacity, uh, the legally designated representative can consent to the research, but you have to go to the HRCDC for consent to the data processing. So I will stop sharing there and uh, thank you very much for your attention.